and I think we're going to have a lot of Skidmore folks on the call too. Yeah, I think we are, especially from class mm -hmm. of 88, so. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Okay, it looks like we are live on Facebook. I'm just gonna hit the record button here. Okay. And turn off my microphone and then we're good to go. Okay. 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 I'm looking at um, lots of folks joining the call. This is wonderful. Uh, welcome to Saratoga Book Festival Online, a monthly virtual book series co-produced by Saratoga Book Festival and Saratoga Springs Public Library with felt help from our friends at Northshire Bookstore. I'm Ellen Beal, a former editor and publisher, and now one of the founding members of Saratoga Book Festival. Allow me to say that if you are not familiar with Saratoga Book Festival, you'll find out more about us on saratogabookfestival.org, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Fred Guttenberg and Sheldon Solomon join us to talk about Fred's new book, Find the Helpers. There we go. What 9-11 in Parkland taught me about recovery, purpose, and hope. Fred spoke about is, is about recovering from unbelievable grief and finding the good in humanity following the death of his dear brother Michael from pancreatic cancer after exposure to dust and chemicals at Ground Zero and the murder of his 14-year-old daughter Jamie at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Fred describes how in the days, weeks, and months following these wrenching losses, he found new purpose. And that purpose was to tirelessly fight for effective gun control legislation. He and his wife, Jennifer, founded a nonprofit organization called Orange Ribbons for Gun Control. Fred has devoted himself to challenging the nation's laws and for working to help elect officials who share this commitment to anti-gun violence legislation. He was also a top surrogate for Joe Biden's successful presidential campaign and is now virtual touring in support of his book. Um, the book is, I've read it, it's, um, it made quite an impact on me. I can tell you that it's powerful, it's inspiring, and the overwhelming message is one of hope um, and how important it is for all of us to be those helpers. Joining Fred in this evening's conversation is Sheldon Solomon, professor at psychology at Skidmore College and co-author of In the Wake of 9-11, The Psychology of Terror and the worm at the core on the role of death in life. Sheldon is an expert on grieving and how individuals and cultures make sense of loss and mortality. He's an American Psychological Society Fellow, a recipient of the American Psychological Association Presidential Citation, a limited career, a lifetime career award by the International Society for Self and Identity, and I should say, a beloved instructor at Skidmore that has a reputation, who has a reputation for changing people's lives. Um, in, in one of those wonderful coincidences in the universe, Fred had a class with Dr. Solomon. So I kind of feel like tonight is going to be extra special. Before we turn things over to these wonderful human beings, um, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Um, we do have a chat box at the bottom of the screen. We invite you to add questions if you like, and we'll try to get to some of them at the end of the program. Um, we also will be typing in resources for you into chat, including a link uh, to where you'll be able to buy uh, Fred's book uh, at North Shore Books, should you, uh, should you like to do that. We're all about uh, supporting the Indies, and uh, uh, North Shore is a really good community neighbor. Um, and um, we'll also have some information about the next Saratoga Book Festival online, which is January 28th. And it will, if, if you wanna look at it this way, I think tonight we'll save, uh, we'll feed our souls and January 28th will actually be 
having a cookbook lesson with a wonderful uh, cookbook author, Anna Frances Gass, who's written a book called The Heirloom Kitchen about all the wonderful um, immigrant cuisines and immigrant women who have uh, just used food as a way to nourish their families. So we're gonna be having a cooking lesson next time around. But with that, I'm gonna turn this over to, to Fred and Sh uh, Sheldon. Sheldon, I turn the virtual mic over to you. Uh, thank you, Ellen. And uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining us this evening. And uh, Fred, good to see you uh, again. Um, you, you as well. Um, just a few minutes before this call, I was actually uh, saying to you how I've done quite a few of these book events, but this is one that I'm really looking forward to and candidly a little uh, more nervous about. Uh, you know, I really am. I'm looking forward to this conversation um, with you, especially knowing your expertise and probably some of the things you took out of the book. So thank you for, for doing this with me tonight. No, uh, thank you, because this cuts uh, both ways. Um, uh, whether you remember this or not, I used to blubber back in the old days um, about an idea that I got from a guy named Eric Crome, who wrote about uh, what's supposed to happen in education. And he said, look, when you start out, you know, professors are like way up here and students are kind of way below. Uh, not because the professors are innately superior, but because they just know a bit more by virtue of the time and experience. But if everything's working out, uh, you know, over time, that, that gulf should diminish a bit till you get to the point uh, where we're approximately equal. But it gets even better than that, because if it keeps going, then the students are going to end up teaching the teachers. Uh, and I find this an exquisite moment to be in a position where uh, after decades ago, I was the teacher, tonight you're the teacher, because I can say with great confidence from the work that I do, uh, that your experiences in life uh, have um, put you in a position to not only have written a very fine book, but to be in a position to, at the risk of sounding, uh, histrionic to uh, actually do something to nudge humanity in, in a productive direction. And so, um, thank you. Very exciting. And uh, hopefully, just the beginning of an exchange of ideas and more importantly, uh, direct action. Um, so, uh, let's, if it's okay, just trot through some of the highlights of, of the sure. book. Uh, and uh, then I'll ask you at the end where things stand now from your perspective. Uh, uh, the book starts out uh, with um, some extraordinary points. Uh, uh, one of my favorite phrases in the book is when you write that grief is love with no place to go. Uh, and um, it's, in the, it's a great point and one that needs to be reiterated because if you didn't love so much, then grief might be inconsequential. Moreover, it's entirely uh, unpredictable and uh, therefore, you know, raises the question of how did you go from there to from grief to the idea of the helpers? What got you to that? leap it's it's a, a, a great question i appreciate it you know i will tell you the first 24 hours after jamie was killed are a whirlwind there are there are minutes in that 24 hours that i remember in such fine detail and there are minutes that are a complete blur and it really for me um, and I want to make this clear. This was for me because my wife, my son, and I, we all had our own very unique experience. But for me, the day after, on February 15th, at the Parkland Vigil, something happened for me. Um, I was there. Um, I just needed to get out of the house and be with the community. And when I got there, the mayor asked me if I wanted to say a few words. And I went up 
to the stage to say a few words, not prepared. And I started talking about how I feel. I started talking about feeling broken. I talked about my fear that in the last minute that I saw my daughter, I wasn't saying, I love you. I was rushing my kids out the door because they were late for school. And I started to talk about how I don't know what I do next. I mean, I was in a really broken place. But the thing that resonates with me from that night more than anything is the thousands of people in the crowd around me. And this, for the first time, the realization, it was gun violence that did this to us. And I went home after that. And I just said to my family, and I really didn't know what I meant by this completely or how I was going to do it. And since it's Sheldon Solomon, and I remember how you were free with the language in class, I will say exactly what I said to them. I just walked in the door and I said, I'm going to break that fucking gun lobby. Um, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how, but I knew I had a purpose that I couldn't let go of. Um, from that point forward, there was a real evolution because only six days later, I think, there was the CNN town hall. And it was my first chance to confront somebody who I believe failed. And I believed all of these people who failed are the reason people are dying of gun violence, like my daughter. And so I confronted Marco Rubio. Um, shortly after that, a few days later, I got a phone call from the person who's going to be the next president of the United States. And he is a man who understands grief. He's been through some of the most horrific types of grief. It was such an amazing call because there was no time limit on it. We probably spent about 45 minutes on the phone. He wanted to know about me, about my wife, about my son, and about my daughter. And that's her behind me. Um, he wanted to know how everyone was doing. And he wanted to know if I knew what I would be doing, what my plan was. And that phone call led to a conversation on mission and purpose, which has formed the foundation of my life since. I'll say this, I'm not sure if there's a right way to grieve or a wrong way to grieve. What I know is, and the only person who ever said this to me was Biden, we all grieve differently. And he instructed me to be aware of that so that as my family and I go forward, we could grieve differently, but be supportive of one another because too many families come apart after moments like this. And so I had this weird thing because for me, I knew I had only one thing that could carry me forward and it was to take on this mission. But at the same time, I had a family who desperately wanted privacy. So I had to balance that out and it's been a process over the past two and a half years of doing that. Yeah, but uh, really important points that I'll second, not by virtue of my knowledge, but living in the same household as my wife, Maureen, who's a, a grief and bereavement counselor and who makes the same point that is very essential. We do not grieve in the same fashion. It's imperative that we recognize that uh, less uh, we must understand uh, somebody else's way uh, of uh, managing their own reactions to tragedies yeah. on, uh, with a deviation from our own expectations. And one of the things that I found uh, quite magnificent about the book is the way that you described everybody in your family who I would describe, um, they're all helpers and they're all heroes and they're all humans in the best sense of the word, 
so can we go back there? Because I, I felt like really powerful was the way you went from helping to hoping to heroes to humans. And I, I thought it was a magnificent progression. And so for the folks that are not maybe intimately familiar with the book, uh, where's the helper's notion come from? You know, the helper's notion for me came later on in the writing. Um, the, when I was planning Jamie's funeral, the funeral director handed me a journal and he said, I want you to have this. Have you ever journaled before? I said, no, I haven't. He goes, promise me you'll start. He goes, I think it'll be good for you. And so I started journaling. Um, and you take that combined with um, basically me writing every emotion I was having on Twitter. Uh, writing became cathartic for me. And so a few months after Jamie was killed, I said to my wife, I want to write our story. I want, I want to write a book. And you know, and for her to be okay with me doing it while she wanted privacy is something I'll be forever thankful for. Um, and in fact, she wrote the afterword to the book because while people don't see her as much, she wanted people to know how she feels about everything that's happening. So I wrote my book and I wrote it pretty straight up telling of my story, you know, a manuscript. And I shared it with somebody who I trust implicitly, thinking I was done. And this person said to me, you're not done. You need to go back and keep writing. Yeah. And, and I said, I'm exhausted. I said, I said, this is everything. I don't have anything else to tell. He goes, oh, he, he goes, yes, you do. He goes, everywhere in your book, I'm reading about people that I want to know more about. He goes, I want you to go back and write more of the details around those moments. And so I spent the next six months rewriting my book to really fill out the stories of all of these amazing people. And the timing turned out to be really important because important things happened in that six months, whether it be related to the campaign and the fact that I officially endorsed Biden or the state of the union and being removed. But these were big moments that I got to talk about in the book. But the helpers part of it is as I was writing and I was talking more and more about these people, it really became clear to me that the what carried me for the two and a half years after Jamie was killed was all of these people. That in every moment of my life and every day, I got to go forward because people had my back, because they helped me. Sometimes people who knew they were doing it, but sometimes people who didn't know they were doing it. Yeah. And, and I can tell you, I don't know that I get through, especially the early days of this, without others. And, and I, I really try to make this case, especially now in a time of COVID, we need each other. We need to be there for each other. And, and, and I tell everyone, always know who your helpers are. And if you're not sure, you know, reach out to a place of worship or a community center. There's plenty of groups, but if you're in a position where you can be a helper, don't miss the chance to do it because people are going to need you. Um, it is, I, I look at what's happening in this country right now with people dying from COVID, dying alone, being buried alone, family suffering alone. And all I can think about is I hope that they have helpers and their people are stepping up to be helpers because that is how we're going to get through this. We do need each other. Yeah. And uh, 
ditto and awesome. Uh, uh, a few things, uh, Fred, I, I love how you go out of your way to emphasize the extraordinary range of what it means to be helpful. Ditto for being heroic. I, I mean, when we think, oh, I got to be helpful. So that means I've got to be, you know, like a brain surgeon or somebody in a position of wealth and power, as you put it in the book. Not at all. Not at all. And uh, you can be helpful and change somebody's life and not even know it. Just the occasional anonymous glance that you have sometimes when you're passing somebody, you know, just giving a little nod like I know that you know that I know that we know. The, the, you know, and I'm and the person. Listen, there's a person in the book that I write about who actually is the one who got me thinking in terms of find the helpers, and really got me searching more on how to tie that all together. And and it is a person who I've never met, hmm. and it actually happened on 9/11 um, when my brother went to the World Trade Center. My family and I knew he was gonna be there. You know, I'm the guy who runs away from stuff like that. My brother was the guy who ran towards stuff like that. And so when 9-11 happened, um, as the morning hours rolled on and we hadn't heard from my brother because we knew his office was also right near there. We knew where he was. And as the early afternoon hours rolled on and we still hadn't heard from my brother, we started fearing the worst. And as the afternoon continued to roll on, my family settled into a place of despair thinking he's gone. Until this lady called my parents and said, I've spoken to your loved one. He is alive, he will call you when he can. And the thing about this lady is she went by where the first responders ultimately set up a triage. She walked through, I mean, you still had dust and debris and poisonous stuff flying around. She walked through it with a pen and paper and said, just give me a name and a phone number. I will call your loved ones for you. And this lady did that. To this day, I don't know who she was. I never will. She's one of the great heroes of my lifetime. She helped my family on this most horrific day, but I'll never know her. Yeah, uh, beautiful and uh, quite perfect. I, I was uh, in Manhattan that day on 9-11 also, and it was uh, a most amazing day. Uh, saw the best of people right in the midst of the worst. And it is grounds for hope. Um, so let's talk about heroism for a bit. Sure. Uh, because uh, I find all of these, uh, I find helping, hoping, being a hero all related. I, I particularly like the way that you described heroism using your brother, Michael, who is a, a huge hero, in my opinion, with a big H, but also a very special kind of hero uh, in that he did the heroic with no desire to be perceived as such. And in, 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 in no. so doing, uh, displayed the ultimate um, manifestation of our humanity at our best. Listen, my brother, um, who I, who I miss dearly, and we were a year apart. We had many of the same friends and we were extremely close. The only real argument that we had in our adult lives was over my belief that the defining part of his adult life was 9-11. And my, it was me. I wanted to do more to honor people like my brother who survived on 9-11 but maybe weren't being paid as much attention to. And so I started reaching out to the memorial because I wanted them to do a better job of highlighting those who survived, who have been sick, 
and maybe went and died years later. They're not on the wall, but they died because of 9-11. And my brother used to get really annoyed at me for making for using his name as part of that process. Yeah. Because he didn't want 9-11 to be his defining moment. For him, what defined his adult life was the teaching and mentoring he did of other doctors. That's what he wanted to be known for. Um, he was so humble. And the crazy thing is, as humble as he was, if there was another 9-11, he'd be the first one running back in, you know, in spite of what he went through the first time. And, and I think, you know, genuine heroes, I think that's probably people who are amazing they don't need to shout it from the rooftops yeah. um and my brother was my daughter was destined to be um i i have the two toughest people ever who stand on my shoulders who push me forward um you know i'm nothing more than jamie's voice when i do what i do but I've now entered this world of gun violence, 40,000 plus people here who die because of it. And my daughter's voice through me, we're going to save lives. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, Jamie Heroic, Michael Heroic, Fred Heroic. I mean, you said, uh, you know, immediately after this terrible tragedy that you were broken. And yet, and you know this better than I, because this is your story, Fred, but you, you said I had to do something. I, I couldn't, you said I couldn't be Fred, but I could be Jamie's father. And uh, even in the midst of, you know, being fundamentally, uh, arguably in a disassociated state, uh, I don't, you couldn't do otherwise. You were a first responder. You, you went right back in uh, and uh, with, uh, you know, Michael and Jamie on each shoulder. And if you had a few more shoulders, uh, I would add the rest of your family, um, your account of your mom as a fighter, your dad uh, as an entrepreneur, um, you have disabused us of uh, one of the most unfortunate fictions in American life, and that's the self-made individual who does heroic things on their own. Um, you've become a force by virtue of the effects that the people around you have had, and that's what has put you in such a remarkable position. All right, another amazing phrase in the book, uh, Fred, is when you talk about going from tragic to magic. And uh, you can twist a phrase. And I, I, I love the way you talked about the power of ritual, the power of ceremony, and the power of symbols. C can you talk a little bit about the ritual that you have with Jamie still? Yeah, you know, listen, um, After Jamie was killed for a while, I was saying, Jamie, she was my daughter, but she was murdered. And I struggled with that. And I eventually came to a place where I said, she is my daughter. And listen, as a parent, we're always responding to what happens to our kids. And we have this need to be close to our kids. Um, my need to be close to Jamie, even though she's gone almost three years, is as strong today as it was when she was alive. And so a couple of things, you know, Jamie and my family, um, Jen, Jesse, Jamie and I, we all have this thing when we say goodbye, we kiss each other three times. Um, and I think the ritual you're probably talking about is when I visit Jamie at the cemetery. Yes. Um, if people see me, they probably would think, what is that guy doing? But Jamie's stone is in the ground and there's a bench. And I go 
I sit with Jamie um, quite regularly. Um, we chose the spot that we did because there's a pond with a fountain out in the distance that I get to look at in a peaceful way and talk to my daughter, um, hoping, asking for signs, telling her what's going on. I have full on conversations. Anyone who knows me or who's watching right now knows I use my hands for everything. And when I sit there talking to Jamie, my hands are just as active. But when I say goodbye to Jamie, I get down on my knees and I kiss her stone three times to say goodbye. Um, I'll do that the rest of my life. Awesome. All right, ceremony, the, your description of Michael going from the hospital to home, description of the funeral. I, I found those events very powerful and very important public displays that are crucial from the perspective of the individuals, but also writ large. Does that yeah. make sense? No, it does. And listen, um, the thing about the day that we took Michael um, from the hospital to hospice, it's a day I'll never forget. And in between, there was a detour to his home. Yeah. So he could walk through there one last time. He was never going to go back. You know, um, what was so memorable about that day, though, is the helpers who unexpectedly showed up. Yeah. Because um, it was my parents and me and my siblings. Uh, and we assumed we were driving Michael ourselves. You know, and we are getting him all packed up to leave the hospital because there was no reason for him to be there anymore. He, he was going to go die on hospice. And we walk out of the room and there's an entire crew of first responders. You know, when you watch first responders in, in their best dress, they got these special uniforms. They are all there waiting. And they were going to transport Michael in an ambulance um, because my brother ran emergency medical services his entire adult life. They were going to make sure he went out in the way that they felt he deserved and they were right. And they provided this unbelievable escort for us to go from the hospital to his home and then to hospice. And what when he eventually passed in hospice, it happened again. You know, the, they again showed up to pay their respects, but to also make sure my brother's body got transported in the way that showed honor from hospice to the funeral home. And then the funeral, um, my humble brother, um, who never wanted any recognition for anything. Yes. Um, he died October 17, 2017. In August of 2017, we as a family all got together and you know we knew time was running out. My humble brother finally had a request and um, he said, I've never asked for anything in life but he goes, I, and I don't want to ask for this or plan this myself, but he goes, I want, you know, a funeral where they shut down the fucking highway. <laughs> that was his request. And, and he got it. They shut down the Southern State Parkway. There was, there was about 75 emergency service vehicles at his funeral. What is really crazy is, my brother's career in emergency service, um, for anyone who may be from Long Island, you may know this place, started at the Colmack Volunteer Ambulance Corps on Long Island. Um, he started as an EMT when he was a teenager. And they had a 1967 Cadillac ambulance that they still have to this day. 
Um, that is the vehicle that transported my brother um, when he went from um, the, the funeral to his final burial place. And, you know, the way these first responders stepped up, just to say to my family, we got you, we've got this, your son will be remembered forever, um, or your brother in my case, um, something that my family will never, ever forget. Yeah. All right. What about symbols? Um, orange ribbon. Yeah. So I um, started two organizations, Orange Ribbons for Jamie and Orange Ribbons for Gun Safety. Um, and the orange, the way that all came to be, Jamie's favorite color was orange. The night that she died, all of her dance sisters got together at the dance studio and started making orange ribbons. Amazing. And the next day they came to our house. Um, Sheldon, I remember this like it was yesterday. They marched up to her room and the, the crying and the just emotion that was going on in that room, I'll never forget it. But while they were up there, they took pictures of themselves wearing their orange ribbons with some of Jamie's stuff. And it went viral through the dance community, um, eventually the dance world, and ultimately actually within a matter of days, Broadway. Um, Broadway shows like Lion King and Hamilton started dedicating performances to Jamie and wearing orange ribbons. So this all started like immediately after she was killed. And on the day of her funeral, I enough had already happened that I talked about the orange ribbons movement. Um, I didn't know what it was exactly. I just knew it was going to that it was meant something. A few weeks later, I was in a Home Depot, and someone came up to me because I wore the orange ribbon every day, and said, "What is that for?" And when I told them, they said, "Do you know that's the color of the gun safety movement?" Which I did not know. I was not part of this before. And so I went home and I told my wife, I want to start our foundation and call it our own ribbons for Jamie. Um, I wanted to make this the symbol of the gun safety movement, but our own ribbons for Jamie is to support things that matter to Jamie in life. Yeah. Um, we support anti-bullying programs. Jamie hated bullies. We support programs for kids with special needs. My daughter volunteered her time for kids with special needs. My daughter, you may have seen my dogs walking behind me at some point. My family and my daughter, dog obsessed. So we support programs through the Humane Society. But we also use the foundation to um, educate around issues of gun violence because that's also why Jamie's life was cut short. Um, and so that's a foundation that my wife has really embraced because it gives her the chance to continue to ensure Jamie's memory is never, ever forgotten. We've started a college scholarship program for kids of all abilities. Um, and then in addition to that, I've also started Orange Ribbons for Gun Safety, which is a purely advocacy-based organization dealing with issues of gun violence and advocating for specific types of change. Awesome. Um another powerful symbol, uh, as well as a literal bodily activity is your idea of standing up for Jamie. Talk about uh, that a bit. Yeah. Um, I think the idea started for me. Um, it started the day of the CNN town hall, actually. Yes. I remember going there and thinking, I'm like, I'm too amped up. I just, I can't sit down. Yeah. So I didn't. And I stood there the whole night. And when I saw photos of it, I, I thought to myself, I need to just keep on standing. There was something about it that resonated with me. And the next morning I was on um, uh, Morning Joe with Mika uh, Brzezinski and Joe Scarborough. And they asked me about it because the images of standing up all ended up on video. And, and I, I said to them, you know, the thing about gun violence in the past 
is the response has always been way too polite, way too temporary. And I have no need and also way too comfortable. That's right. And I don't want to make people comfortable talking about my daughter. And one way for me to make sure they didn't get comfortable was to not sit down. Yeah. So when I went to DC three weeks later for my first visit, and I'm with all these legislators, for those who haven't been to a congressman's office or a senator's office, it's they're by design actually very comfortable places, very comfortable chairs, usually around a coffee table where you sit down and everybody gets chummy and it's a very pleasant conversation. And it's a way to keep conversation really mild. <laughs> and so I would go to these offices and they'd invite me to sit down and I'd let them know I, I, I'm intending to stand. And I'd tell them, you could either stand with me or you could sit down, but I'm going to stand. And it just became the thing I did. Um, I refused to sit down with everyone when talking about why my daughter died. Nobody should be comfortable about that. Nobody should feel okay with that. And so I'm not going to change my approach. And it forced legislators to have to stand and listen um, and absorb or not, but it definitely resonated with a bunch. Yeah, I, I find it remarkable. And you had uh, the way you presented it is very graceful. I'm going to stop us soon, Fred, and let the, some questions come in. But I wanted to ask oh, you. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, just uh, two more things uh, very quickly. One is that uh, you mentioned now, uh, hopefully soon to be President uh, Biden. And, uh, oh, he won. <laughs> and that's not the grounds for my reservations. We'll talk about that another day. But um, I do want to uh, uh, encourage folks that are listening uh, to read the book because it's fantastic. But I, I love the way you describe your interactions with politicians. It was uplifting <laughs> to find that they're not all scoundrels. Um, and th that's awesome. I also uh, really liked um, the, the progression of your description of your interaction with Joe Biden culminating in uh, your um, endorsing his candidacy for president. And I like in your account that you just said more than anything, he's trustworthy. And I, I just thought that was um, a nice point. And last thing, and then we'll turn it over to folks. Um, what next? How do you think things are going? And uh, in a proverbial nutshell, what's what's up next on the docket? You know, um, for the next month, for the first time since Jamie died, I'm actually going to breathe a little bit and and enjoy the peace. You know, everything that I had done. Let me take a step back. Gun violence is a nonpartisan issue. Bullets don't know if you're Republican or Democrat, but it was clear the response to it is partisan. Not always. I've met plenty of Republicans who want to solve this problem, but in DC, it is partisan. And so for me, I want the mission to break this by doing something in the elections became all encompassing. And November 3rd mattered a whole lot to me. We still have more work to do because it'd be better if the Senate were on board with this. But the, the, what's next? Now helping those who got elected to, in, to get legislation passed and holding them accountable if they don't. Um, listen, for me, this is all about saving lives. This wasn't about just saying, there's only one party that can solve this problem. In fact, I'm hoping for a bipartisan solution, but it's, it is saying that now that I believe those who said they will do it are there, it's gonna to be to hold them accountable and to push them to make sure 
it gets done. Too many people in this country are dying right now. You know, two and a half years ago, when Jamie was killed, we had about 300 million weapons on the streets. We're now closer to 400 million. Okay. It's, it's insane when you think about that. And at the start of the COVID outbreak, there were very purposeful decisions made to treat gun stores as essential businesses. They were like literally the only thing that could open and a gun surge got unleashed on this country. Why that matters is you have a lot of first time gun owners who I don't think are gonna use their weapons on someone else, but economic despair, they may turn and use it on themselves. And, and so we need to deal with the reality of these weapons that are out there and we need a real national response to do it. We need to treat it as the public health emergency that it is. And I'm counting on this administration to do that. that that's awesome. Um, let's leave it at, uh, at that. You end the book, Fred, by you know pointing out the power of perspective and the hope that seeing things uh, more broadly is going to be uh, useful and inspiring. And I hope that what you've said this evening uh, will push us forward in that regard. And, you know, that you end the book by saying, everybody, uh, be a helper, seek help, accept help. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the future well-being of humankind depends on us taking that advice. And so thanks for being here tonight. And for those of you that have been Thank listening, you. and uh, let's take some questions. Thank you, Sheldon. Great. Thank you, Sheldon. And thank you, Fred. We've got some questions coming in. In fact, one is a, um, and it makes an interesting jumping off point from your last statement, Fred. Um, uh, one of our uh, uh, participants writes, as a widow of suicide due in part to the gun laws, I continue to be challenged due to complicated grief. Living in the past, how do I move forward to live in the present? I spoke to President-elect Biden about writing about my story as well. Can you talk a little bit about your process about how you started journaling and writing? Yeah, and, and I'm going to start it by reminding of something else I said, which is we all do this differently. Um, and so I think my process was unique for me. My wife's was very different. But for both of us, there were some common features. And for both of us, it definitely involved other people. Um, it definitely involved connections to those who were already a deep part of our lives, but allowing new people into our lives as well. Um, it involved for both of us, different approaches to honoring the memory of our daughter. You know, never, I, for me, I think the most important part of going through grief is, is always acting like Jamie's dad. Um, you know, as, as a dad, we always respond, or as, as a parent, I should say, to what happens to our kids. And for me, every day, I need to have that feeling that I'm still responding to what happens to my kids. Um, and my wife is the same way, but her response and her approach is different. Um, I, I would certainly say if that person offline maybe if there's a way to connect and they want to have ongoing dialogue about this because one of the things that i do now is is i do talk to people across the country oh, wow. um you know about going forward um, my 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 rabbi said at jamie's funeral we don't move on we move forward and every day for me is a journey of moving forward um and I tell my wife and son all the time, as hard as it is, I intend to be okay because I have a 20 year old son and I'm gonna watch him grow up and I'm gonna harass him for the next 50 years and I need to be okay so I can do that. Um, so I hope this was helpful, but I, if that person has a way to give you, you know, their contact information, I'd certainly be happy to continue that. 
Yes, to that person, feel free to email us at Saratoga Book Festival um, at gmail.com and I can make that happen. That's very generous of you, Fred. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we did have a question from someone who really enjoyed the book and that particular quote you mentioned from your rabbi about we don't move on, we move forward. And what does that mean to you, the person wanted to know? You know what? For me, it means every day getting up and being me. It means every day getting up and still being a husband to Jen and a father to Jesse and my two dogs. It means every day getting up and ensuring that this new mission that I'm on, which is the most important thing I've ever done in my life, is something that I get to continue doing. Uh, you know, listen, um, I talk in the book, and maybe this is part of what motivates me about guilt. And I have this horrific guilt that my voice wasn't a part of this when it was other people's kids. And so for me, going forward also means never, ever, ever stop using my voice. Now that, you know, uh, you know unfortunately became my kid. Um, but it, it, I guess it going forward in a weird way for me is somewhat dealing with that guilt. We've also had a few um, people who write in, is there a way uh, or address that you could give at some point, Fred, for people to write to you? Is it foundation, yeah. perhaps? Or, mm -hmm. um, we, I have a, a foundation um, address. And so if you send it to Orange Ribbons for Jamie, you know, attention, Fred Guttenberg, it's 5944 Coral Ridge, Road, Coral Ridge Drive, I'm sorry, okay. um, number 301, and that's Coral Springs, Florida, 33076. Okay, and, um, and for perhaps for those of you, we'll try to get that up on chat. I see a couple of people are, are, are raising hands and doing Q&A. And it works easier, if you don't mind, if we work through chat so that we're not bouncing among the, uh, <laughs> the different <laughs> places to post things. Um, I, I will also say, uh, oh, okay, so, so here's another question that is, is a little bit different. So let's do that while we have yep. the time. It is, how do you manage relationships with those who have very different opinions from yours regarding legislation? or the way you use your voice? Have you ever had to walk away from a friendship? You know, it's a great question. And I've spent the past two and a half years talking to a lot of people <laughs> who do have very different opinions from me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the key thing is to talk, um, to, to engage, not to say you're wrong, but to engage. There are people who are so set in extreme positions that, that sometimes that talk part becomes harder. Um, but the majority of people, the majority of Americans are a lot more reasonable and open-minded and wanting to talk than maybe the extreme things that um, get picked up sometimes on media would lead one to suggest. I've spoken with people in the gun lobby. I've spoken with legislators who disagree. I've spoken with friends who disagree. And when you talk, you often learn there's a lot more you agree on that can lead to enhance public safety than you disagree on. But you have to be willing to talk. Well, I think that is a pretty Good note to finish on. Um, I think uh, we'll all have to take that lesson very much to heart uh, in the next uh, whatever, Hard. however long we're going to be living through this period of, of in, intense uh, fragmentation. 
But, you know, I'll just say this. Um, and I do, I have such hope for the future. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I just think, I know I don't know if there truly is like a pendulum theory in terms of the way mm -hmm. society moves, but I just think we're gonna swing to a place where decency and civility and humanity and empathy are gonna matter more. And maybe it is because of COVID, maybe it's because of who the next president is gonna be. But I think some of the, um, the division is gonna go away. And I think if, if Americans can think in terms of togetherness and helpfulness and helping one another, I think we're gonna be okay. And I think we're going into a place that's more likely for that to happen. To happen. Well, you've been listening to Fred Guttenberg and Sheldon Solomon. Um, we thank both of you for joining us this evening. Um, it was a really uh, wonderful, deep conversation. I truly um, am glad that uh, we had this time together. Uh, we will be, we have recorded this. We'll probably have it on the website within 48 hours or so. Great. And it will be on Facebook pretty much instantaneously. We were live streaming it. We just have to do a few things to just keep it on our Facebook page. So thank you so much. Great conversation. Thanks for everyone who attended. The book again is Find the Helpers. Oh, sorry about the reverse type there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. There you go. Um, cool. And uh, uh, the uh, just lost my train of thought. Find the helper. Oh, my thought was going to be. And Fred, you have certainly been a helper tonight. So thank you very cool. much. <laughs> thank you for having me. And Sheldon, um, in a post-COVID world, I'm going to come back to Saratoga and attend one of your classes. Absolutely. So, uh, you'll be seeing me in Florida, so it's going to cut both ways. Let's do it. I'd love to see you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Good come night, to the book everybody. festival. <laughs> Good night. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Bye-bye.